Hello folks and welcome to a brand new season episode, whatever you want to call it, on the Coworking Values podcast. And we're going to call this one The Renegades of Flow. And with me is my secret long-time collaborator, Emily. Emily, what are you known for and what would you like to be known for? What am I known for? I'm known for my calm demeanor and bringing a lot of groundedness into a situation. And I would like to be known for helping people out of their quagmire of work. You, um, I think you're known, you're known in my situation for helping me out. So I was, I was, before we started here, I was just checking where we met and, um, it has been a very long time. And on the 12th of July, 2011, you sent me an email saying, thank you so much for connecting on LinkedIn when you work for that event tech company so mm-hmm. that is like 13 years i'm not very good at maths but. <laughs> uh, uh no yeah 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 that is 13 years yeah you're right because because i want to for the uh both the regular listeners of the co-working values podcast we need to frame this a little bit because we we met we did that we went to the conference in san francisco and hang out with all the uh, guardians of the sharing economy in 2013 and then we, we were doing all the stuff on We Share Radio, which then, um, over years, turned into what people are listening to now, because th- this podcast originally was on the Reshare, We Share Radio, which is OUI Share Radio Network, and we were talking about co-working from, must have been like 2013, and, um, and then it came over here, and, it's, and we rebranded it as a co-working values podcast in 2019 with Jelco. And that's what leads us here. So what is, um, this is Renegade to Flow, and this is more about how to work than co-working in 15-minute cities. And in this, ep- in this episode, we're going to kind of introduce this new tangent to the podcast that you're normally familiar with, which is all about anything to do with co-working, basically. So where, Emily, where were you when the idea of, Renegades of Flow came to you? Um, oh my gosh, Renegades of Flow. The, the, the concept specifically was, I think, like last October, but it's something you and I have been hatching for a really long time. I think the first time we talked about um, a scrum of one, um, I'm, I'm a certified scrum master, many people are. Um, I take it more in the individualistic sense of you've got a whole team of you know, well-trained horses in your head, hopefully they're well-trained and you've got to get them all pointing in the same direction. And I found that very effective in my own life. Um, And of course, you and I having the sort of rapport that we have always had, uh, it was just sort of a no no brainer um, that when last year um, you were sort of struggling with your workflow and you contacted me again and I said, hey, uh, let me spend a couple hours every week um, and we'll see if we can't uh, get you out of this whirlwind. And it seems like to, to a degree by increments that's been happening um, and it requires a lot of commitment. And I, I commend you for that. Thank you. And that, now, now it's like a slightly forceful breeze rather than a, uh, rather than a whirlwind. But that, that is, that is something like in the, in the creator right club, which is probably the most public place um, People always come to that and sit around the table and do their writing and whatever they're doing. But there's some form of like overwhelm that occurs in various degrees. And then when you get into when you get into like anybody running a business is which bit, you know, which bit do you do first? Both you and I, are, you know, with Anne Hawkins in Drive and everybody, which is a particularly like open, transparent and vulnerable networking group. And you know, just this morning we were talking about how juggling being a parent, running a business, keeping up with all the obligations. And I, I've yet to meet, everyone always seems to be looking really cool and got it together. And really, you know, no so does. many people, so many people are playing whack-a-mole. Um, and like, how, how do you, I knew you said like, how do you not play whack-a-mole? But that's, that's what I want to know. You know, how do you not play whack-a-mole? 
Well, it's more about, um, it's, to a degree, any business owner has got to, <laughs> you know, there's, there's no avoiding it. There's going to be, there's things that pop up that you have to feel you, you can plan and you can set everything up the best way you know how, but ultimately when the real world comes in contact with your business, you're just going to have to do the whack-a-mole game. Um, and if you set things up appropriately, it won't make you break a sweat too much, hopefully. Um, and won't have a resounding effect on your bottom line if that's what's really important to you. But yeah, go ahead. I, I was I was gonna try and arm wrestle the uh, the time thing in there because um, before we came on, we were talking about that. And one of the most effective things and I kind of already knew about it, but I didn't have anyone. If I, I couldn't do it on my own. And that is, um, this sounds so remedial when I say it out loud, is assigning time to different tasks. And, you know, whether that's update a WordPress plugin, you know, schedule a podcast, uh, you know, write a brief for a client. Um, it all how you know the how much time you think time how much time you think something will take and how much time it actually takes uh, are often very very different things um and that whole i remember like this morning we were talking about the fibonacci sequences and great dames versus chihuahuas and like getting getting a handle on how big something will be and how much energy it will take yeah well, th those are all important factors, and they are certainly that. That's how you learn to contextualize your work, because a lot of the time, we have an impression over about what we're doing um, that's not entirely accurate. And I'm sure this is no surprise to anyone. Um, but being able to go back and look at it and saying, "This is how long I thought it would take, how much effort I thought it would take," and then retrospectively looking back and saying, "This is how much it actually took." Um, this is what it actually required. And maybe this is how we could approach it um, more in a more optimized way in the future. And that's the way you sort of recover that energy very slowly, piece by piece. Um, but there's also a part of it that is extremely emotional, that, that resistance that you come across when you are engaging with something that is very difficult, that is very confusing. Um, and we call it, you've heard me use this term a million times, but existential overhead, all that stuff that you're carrying in your head, um, that you don't have, you're not quite sure where it goes and it hasn't been sort of put into, um, it doesn't, hasn't had borders drawn around it so that you can actually wrap your head around it and break it down into first steps. Those first steps are the most important ones, right? Um, that, that, that existential overhead thing is... You know, it's, like, it's not like I didn't know about it, but going through the process of uh, de-dramatizing the existential overhead was so valuable. Right. It, 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 when it goes, when existential overhead is minimal, that's sort of ideal because you've already, always got some, some the things that you're holding in your head right now and saying, okay, this is, these are the things I need to remember to do what I'm doing. And anyone who's ever meditated for 30 seconds knows how this is. As soon as your thoughts go still, the next steps start popping up and you feel, oh, I got to remember to do this. Oh, I got to put that into place, you know. Um, but when it goes wrong is I, I sort of think of this as like um, a resistance abscess, like in your mind, where the pressure of all of the existential overhead becomes so great that it sort of starts to cannibalize everything good in your head and turn it against you. Um, and that's when you start to have those kind of where even just getting up is difficult because you've already been drained um, of everything good that's in your, in, in your flow. If we're to go back to flow there. You need to have energy for it. And if it's all bound up in resistance because it's just too much, it's just too overwhelming, then you never even get to the first step. That's why they say the hardest thing to do if you're going to sit down to write, I'm a writer, you're a writer, is just sitting down in the seat. Absolutely. There's, I, 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 I started to feel okay when I heard 
uh, Brenny Brown talking one day and she said, this is years and years ago, and she said it takes her about an hour to decide to write, then sit down, move everything around her desk, clean underneath her keyboard, and then actually start writing. And I know there's a bit of me walking around thinking that everyone just like sat down and suddenly it, you know, dropped out of them. Um, and I've been, you know, writing every day. Like since you, I think it was like 2012 or something, you introduced me to 750 words. And I've got like nearly 3 million words in there now. Wow. And I always have to think about what to write. And and, and that, that's been an interesting journey in itself because that, how I write that, and what I write in there has, has like just evolved all the time. But the practice of, you know, it's a really mentally healthy thing to do. And also, you know, like the self-discovery. But th- there was, um, can, you, can you say a little bit more about the resistance? Because that, like, that's a, the, the Stephen Pressfield distinction. And I'm constantly fascinated by it. It's probably one of the best yes. things I've ever heard in my life. Yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, the, the the War of Art, um, fantastic book. I've read it many times. Um, and boy, I could talk about resistance all day. But this was I was just saying this to you yesterday. The um, the truth is that that uh, resistance is strength misapplied. It's when you have gathered all of your forces to kind of put up this wall, which is really based in fear against something you're not ready to face yet. It's, it's always emotional and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, there are some people out there who might think that, you know, having an emotional issue is a weakness. I think the people in the circle that are probably listening to this podcast understand that that's not true. It's just human. We're human beings. We have feelings. Uh, they can build up. Um, but you're basically uh, afraid of, of the, um, picking it apart, of cracking it open, finding something that you don't don't want, um, and but once you see the doubt for what it is, uh, the mon- mental construct that it is just kind of dissolves, um, and you're able to take that energy that was engaged in resistance and apply it to something that is actually um, helpful to you and to your life. So you recover that strength, uh, but like any energy, it's energy transformed and the mind becomes pliant. It becomes a tool instead of, uh, you, you know, uh, gathered to stop you in your tracks. What, what do you think about, um, like, cause I was listening to Stephen Pressfield talking to uh, Rick Rubin and they were on this little bit here. And Stephen Pressfield says that it, you know, like the being creative is an everyday battle because you're in this battle to overcome the resistance. And, you know, like I hang on every word that guy says, but it felt like, I didn't know whether it was, I really didn't know whether it was like a realistic analysis or his personal experience, or I found it quite a negative distinction. Like creativity is a battle. And I certainly do have a battle, but I, there are definitely days when I'm, you know, being creative, whether that's like podcasting or putting stuff together or writing where it, it is in, it is in flow and, it, and it's a really enjoyable thing. And I crave being in that area like this unconsciously. There's always this, I just need to make something every day. So yeah. it, what, do you, what do you think? The question inside that bit there, sorry, Emily, is what do you think of the distinction about battle? Well, I think it's it's important to know that um, just like with all things, resistance comes on a spectrum and it can go a very negative place and it can go a very positive place, but it's still based in fear. So um, on one side, you have fear of failure and the other side, you have fear of success, right? Because um, yep. once, you, once you're successful, you have to repeat it. Uh, you have to own it. Um, and once you failure, failure is a little bit easy because it requires less action and it can become, you know, a self-fulfilling prophecy. And then it feels like, oh, I was right. And there's a little bit of satisfaction in that, oddly enough. So a, a good way to, to think about this is if, if you're thinking of resistance as stopping you from getting somewhere that you want to go, imagine the same 
uh, powerful resistance, but against, uh, against something that you don't want to happen. So for example, let's say you're a doctor and you have to give a terminal diagnosis to a patient and you're, 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 you don't play it out. Don't play out the scenario in your mind or anything, but um, just imagine that that place where the doctor is about to walk in the room, about to step into that expectation and give that that negative response that nobody wants to hear, but he has to because it's the truth on the other side. Now the doctor has to be trained to push through that resistance, to push through his own or her own mental or emotional re resistance to step in there and give that bad news. And a lot of the time they'll have to sort of dehumanize themselves and the person they're talking to to do it. But other doctors can do it with compassion. And that's kind of the way you need to approach it. When you have the, uh, something positive on the other side, you have to give yourself a little bit of compassion. And I feel like a lot of people, and there's no wrong way to do this. Um, if, if, if people approach it and it feels like a battle and they feel that they can penetrate it by, you know, getting that sort of warrior punching through attitude, then they can do it. But many of us have to approach it with that self-compassion to crack open the resistance. And then you receive that energy back into yourself and you can apply it to the creative endeavor that you're about to get into. That's a, that's a very powerful distinction, Emily. No, I, I, was, I was transfixed there. As you were going through that, what kept popping in my mind as well was the, um, I did this exercise in a workshop the other day about the critical voice. And we had to, basically we had to like write a paragraph about what our critical voice tells us all the time. And, um, and then read it out loud to two other people. And, it, and it's a very, you know, connected group. So it was, a, it was a safe space as we like to say, but it really flipped a, flipped the switch for me because when you, when you it completely, you know, it completely disarmed the critical voice because it sounds so ridiculous when you like have to a write it down and capture it and then, and then read it out loud. And there's this, and I, I, so why, what made me say that is because I felt a lot of, I can't, I can't put an exact percentage on it, but I felt a lot of resistance just went up in smoke as a result of doing the exercise. Um, not sure what you can do with that, but I feel it, it felt very connected to what you just said. Yeah. There's a, resistance is always shielding the truth. And in order to realize the truth, um, well, you need to realize the truth or it will turn into one of those abscesses like I just described before. And I have experienced this firsthand where I have taken, I've had stories I wanted to write in me and they stayed there for a decade <laughs> before I could let them out because of that resistance that, and it abscessed. And then every time you, you, I sat down to write, it was so painful to even sit down in the chair that I would sit down and bounce right back up and then go clean my house or something like that. And anybody who's written or done anything creative understands that kind of impulse. But that's that's the response to creative. It's like sitting on a pin or something and it just pops you right back up like, nope, too painful, can't do it. And that's the resistance just deflecting you. That, that That's one of the, like, the, the way he writes about how what what you'll just I'm, I'm sure not everybody agrees with what he writes but you know the, the way he writes that you will just like make yourself sick you will just put you will unconsciously put yourself through so much to avoid doing it and I think a lot of what you and I did last year was um you know unpacking resistance and you know there's so many things that I like intellectually I wanted to do and I just you know, would go down so many rabbit holes, different directions to avoid, you know, pressing publish on something or send on something. Um, and, you know, I'm in a position where I'm kind of managed to organize life to do things I really, whether they're challenging or not, you know, they're like things I, I really want to do. Um, the, the other thing we've got to get in here before the end is the whole, like, uh, neurodiversity thing because i i like that's something you really helped me with with this mm -hmm. with the structure you bring is 
Um, somewhere on somewhere on LinkedIn the other day, people were. I think it was Jamie um, was talking about a backlog and a Trello board and stuff. And one thing Emily and I do every week is sit down and go through our Kanban board, which is in a tool called Upbase, which is like Trello. And there's the backlog. And anything that's like a, a squirrel idea or a cool idea or like, why don't we, why don't we open an, an airline or something like that, um, yeah. goes in the backlog until, and then there's like the doing column, we watch what we're working on now. And that's, I, I don't want this to sound like a foolproof system because some things stay in the do, do, doing column and are subject to immense resistance, um, but they, mm-hmm. they live there. And I go back to the, the backlog and the stuff that, I can't even remember having the idea of and is of no consequence. And if we'd opened that can of worms, it would have just, you know, sucked energy out of other things. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And that happens a lot. So that's why you don't fight those things. Like when they come up, just put it in the backlog and, and leave it. Um, and then when you go through for your retrospective after a couple of weeks or a couple of months, whatever your cadence of work is, you can go back and you can look at that stuff and say, wow, that was a stupid idea. Or you can say, you know, this is still worth revisiting. This is still still kind of fresh. So let's pop that higher up on the list and make, maybe put a priority on maybe taking an hour and doing some market research around it or whatever. And that's the way you get the good stuff. That's the way you, you know, crack open the Langolier and you're able to see what's really good and what's just a lump of coal. So what is... um. What should we think about for next time? Because we, 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 we're in that situation where we know what we're going to like explore here. But um, what would you like people to go away and think about and then introduce into the next episode? Um, I, I would like to hear about the, the struggles people are having with their workflow. Um, everybody has them to, set, to some degree. And as a person who's always been... Um, aside from brief stints here or there, I've always been self-employed. I've always had to kind of uh, motivate myself. I hate that word, actually, <laughs> motivate that sort of internal motivation. Um, how, how do you come about it? What things have worked for you? And where are you stuck? Yep. And we can, if you, if you like, for most people, we're going to be listening to the first episode. If you DM us on LinkedIn or WhatsApp us with a question, we can answer it in the show. And there's lots of there's lots of places we go around each week where we'll we'll be able to get questions. And it's always really good helping people unpick real life problems. So a few weeks ago, we did in the Creator Right Club, we did a an online workshop for uh, goal setting, and you know Emily had a a program for the session but when people when we what yeah which was already really good but then when people started coming in and saying oh i've got a problem with this i've got a problem with this and we started workshopping it um that was that was really exciting and personally i found most things are more interesting when they're kind of you know hot seat done live and people come with a real life problem rather than a hypothetical kind of you know academic situation from 19 19- 73 um one thing i'm dying to ask that's been hanging in my head if if people were going to go and read a couple of books or follow a couple of people emily where 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 would you direct them and i have to say that we both of us are big believers in you make your own system so we're certainly not asking people to subscribe to this um fanatical once only system but you know who, who are the who are the authors that you've got a lot out of well, for myself personally, um, and everybody's different. Um, I, I've read every productivity book out there, um, I believe, and and certainly what I've what I've learned is just to take take what you can and leave the rest um, from any system. Uh, test it, look back on it, m- uh, do it in iterations, and ad- adapt to the changes of your life. But to pick a specific author, I would have to say. David Allen's Getting Things Done was an early um, game changer for me. And then um, uh, uh, the fundamentals of Scrum, you know, Jeff Sutherland and um, all all that crew. If you're able to digest the extremely 
corporate speak in those types of books and interpret them for a more independent workflow, they might be useful. Um, but for me, I've always just taken it and turned it into whatever I need at the moment. I would just encourage people to take what they can, use what they can and develop it, and don't be worried about a specific cult of productivity. Definitely. That's, I, I think um, we were, we've got the, the Jeff Sutherland book, um, Getting Twice, we'll put a link in the show notes to these folks, but Getting Twice the Work Done in Half the Time is it, it, Jeff Sutherland is one of the, when everyone runs around the world going like, oh, we're agile working, we're agile working. Jeff Sutherland was, um, I can't remember the name of the other guy, were part of a team that wrote the Agile Manifesto in a ski lodge in something like 20, sorry, 1998 or something. And um, that, that, those two books, I find, I know they are aimed at big companies, but that is one of, the, when I read that book in like 2014, it made me understand Trello finally because I didn't really understand how a Kanban thing works. So a lot of, you know, Monday and Asana and like nearly everything's got some form of Kanban board in it. And mm -hmm. 10 years ago, it didn't. And I was like, oh, that's it. Because it is just, when we talk about Kanban and scrumming and stuff like that, it's like having um, post-it notes on a wall, which is probably where it originally came from, isn't it? You know, post-it notes on a wall. This column is doing, this column is to do, and this column is the, we'll get to that later, you know, park your car park backlog thing. And is that, was that too crude the way I described it? No, no, I don't think so. I would describe it more as like self parenting your work. Um, you know, cause it's just like, you could write a parenting manual. Everybody's tried to, but honestly you could only write one parenting manual for each child. And then af that only after they're already grown up. <laughs> yeah, so you kind of have to write your own manual. That is that one of the best things I ever did when I became a parent was I ran, I read one book on parenting, which was the, uh, the baby whisperer, which was recommended to me by Julius. And I deliberately didn't read anything else because I knew, I, and there's some great stuff out there, but I knew I'd be reading it and like panicking about, you know, whether I would given him the right color bowl and it would, you know, affect his chances of getting into university 50 years later. Okay. Um, we should go. And where can people find you online, Emily? We can link to it in the show notes as you, as you come out. Absolutely. You can find me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm pretty easy to find there. That is my only social profile. I quit social media back in 2020, and I'm delighted that I did it. I'm everywhere online, Bernie J. Mitchell. Um, <laughs> what, a, what a whore. Um, and also, <laughs> Emily has the podcast which is about accessibility and remote work and what, what else is in there you know like, there's some good stuff going on there we can link to rosie's episode yeah for sure um uh working with accessibility issues is one of my favorite things because um because there are extra challenges in there that need to be seen through um and i have a really strategic brain about these things i see the paths that lead to things and lead away to think from things so I'm able to kind of parse things um, in a way that when you're really close to the situation, uh, you, you may not necessarily be able to. Beautiful. So thank you very much for your time and attention today, folks. If you type into your nearest search engine, Coworking Values Podcast, you can find us all there. You can also find us at the European Coworking Assembly and the London Coworking Assembly. And at the time of production, we'll be in London at the end of February for the Workspace Design Show. We'll be doing two breakfast show events and you can hear about all of them on our newsletter, which you can sign up at the places I just mentioned. And be careful out there, it is a jungle. 